important important rule for life. Um, exactly. Preston, I get enough of your comments uh, between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. I don't really I don't really feel like I need them following me home. All things being equal, um, you know, when I die and go to hell. Uh, let's see, a comment section populated entirely by, I don't know, you and who else who gives me a hard time? I have a few students at the school who give me a hard time. So a couple years removed from the worst I ever had, which was a student who told me, in all seriousness, I quote, it didn't seem like I was a fit parent. <laughs> and then when I chuckled, he was like, no, I'm being serious. <laughs> yeah, that was a low point in my career. Anyway. Just start land at your on, onwards and upwards. Uh, oh, that's true. I am. Well, this is why I'd like to comment. On no doubt. So anyway, we talked about the basic structure of DNA, and again, we don't need to go through what we talked about yesterday. But at its most basic, who can tell me the structure of a single DNA monomer? First of all, the fact that I say that DNA has monomers—what's that mean? That can make one. Yeah, it's a single compound, absolutely, that's true. This is all covalently bound to itself. Um, all covalent bonds, what else? Yeah. Yeah, so you can take these and you can stick them together. When we take these and stick them together, how does that work? How does that happen? Come on, Ben, how you doing? Yeah, absolutely, make sure you unplug it. Condensation reactions, what's condensation reaction? True, that's correct, that's a good answer. Yeah, between two OHs and it's going to release what? Water. Water. Now, if you have two OHs and you release an H2O, that's both of the hydrogens, but only one of the oxygens. So what ends up happening? Sorry? Yeah, they get bonded to each other with an oxygen between them. And we call that an ether bond. If there's a, also a double bond to oxygen associated with it, we call it an ester bond, but it's, it's the same idea. Um, what are the three components of a nucleotide, the single DNA mo monomer? Sorry? I heard somebody say it. Good. And the kind of central piece, the piece that holds it all together, is that sugar. What sugar is used in DNA? Deoxyribose. And then on its one prime carbon, on the first carbon, we count clockwise from the oxygen in this ring structure. On the first carbon is where we find the base, which could either be an adenine, a thymine, a guanine, or a cytosine. And as we move across on the fifth carbon, right opposite it, we find the phosphate group. And if we see here in yellow, I've highlighted where the OH groups that these will use to bond to one another actually are located. So they bond between the three prime and the five prime. Uh, prime. John prime? Five prime carbon. Uh, though the OH group isn't actually attached to the carbon on the five prime, it's actually off the phosphorus of the phosphate group. But still, we say it's the three prime and the five prime of the sugar that are involved in bonding. Right? So this whole side of the molecule isn't involved in bonding. This whole side of the molecule is just connected to the base. And of course, when that happens, you end up with this chain, and along this whole side of the chain will just be nitrogenous bases. Do those stay open and exposed to the elements? The nitrogenous base, of course, is where we actually put the code, where we actually put the information that we want to store. Do we leave that exposed to the elements? What happens to it? How? Yeah, DNA is double-stranded. So those nucleotides will attach another strand of DNA to itself. Now that won't actually be a covalent bond. They aren't, uh, they aren't actually the same compound. They're two separate compounds, but they're held together by what kind of bonding? Hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic interactions, hold them together in place. Um, and those two strands have to be complementary. What's it mean that they're complementary? Yeah, what do we mean when we say opposite each other? Yeah, and reverse in what way? Like, do they go, like, if this one goes. Uh, a, A, C, G, G, C. Does this one just go in reverse? A, A, C, G, C. Whatever, I lost my spot, but you get the idea. 
Okay, so first of all, we'd say the strands are anti-parallel, which, what's that mean? Let's say up here we had a free phosphate group. If there's a free phosphate group at the top of this, which side would we say of the molecule this is? Free phosphate group up here. We'd say that's the five prime side, which means down here would have to be three prime, which means there'd be a free what? OH group, good. Okay, and so the first thing you told me is that this strand goes opposite, or it goes, what's the terminology we use? Anti-parallel, which means if it's the five prime of this strand up here with a free phosphate group, what will be at the top of this one? And what will be free? Just the hydroxide group, good. And then down here obviously would have to be that phosphate group and that would be the five prime end. And then what will this chain be? Again, is it just this in reverse, C, C, G, C, A, A? No, it actually is informed by this because if there's an A on this strand, when this strand gets made, it can only lock in place if it is a T. And then here, and then here, G. I don't know what letter that is. That might be part of a Q. It could be a six that didn't quite happen. Anyway, we'll, uh, see, I was thinking it looked more like a C, but okay, we'll say it's a G. Okay, okay, I'm cool with that. That's good, I support that. All right, so there we go. Good. All right, if you have that in mind as we go through today's lesson, everything we talk about today should actually make a lot of sense. Now, there's a lot of detail there's a lot of specific details in today's lesson, but that's okay. Um, before we get to today's lesson, we said that letter code, so that the order of those letters forms a code. And the cell can read that code and use it to make stuff, right? So we learned in the last unit about kinases. So there's a section of your DNA where if the cell reads that code, it tells the cell exactly how to make you know, uh, one blue bit phosphonucleate glucokinase, right? Um, there's a spot on your DNA that if the cell reads it, tells it exactly how to make an ATP synthase molecule. There's a spot on your DNA uh, that isn't on your DNA, but that is in a plant's DNA that tells it exactly how to make photosystem one. Another one that tells it exactly how to make photosystem two. One for plastoquinone, one for quinone, one for cytochrome B6S. Everywhere on your DNA we need to make something in the cell, is a section of our DNA that we can read and tell us the cell how to make that. And then there's other sections of the DNA that also tell it when to make that and when not to. Hey, if you're a muscle cell, you're gonna wanna make a bunch of the stuff that goes in the mitochondrion. If you're a skin cell, not so much. All that information has to be coded and it can only be coded using this little four letter alphabet, A, B, C, T. Um, we, of course, have how many letters in our alphabet? Yeah. Um, so you can imagine using only four letters. If we want to code information to build everything that's in our cell, um, remember when we looked up the structure of, say, ATP synthase, it's a big molecule, right? Um, in fact, if we look it up, instead of just looking in mole view, if we look up ATP synthase in a protein database, um, like P, uh, uh, right? Oh, it's the molecule of the month. Well, there you go. That's a big molecule, right? Like, look at it all. Um, do they have the database entry for it here uh, at PubChem or at PDB? Um, that's right, the protein database. Um, You have to get very specific with these because obviously like different, uh, different uh, organisms have slightly different versions of this. So this comes from a bacterium, bacillus. But you can see it's quite similar to ours. And if you actually look down here, um, they should have the actual genetic code it takes to make this. Hopefully they do. So I wanna show you um, that it's a uh, big sequence. Hello sequence, where are you? That is the uh, amino acid sequence, but I wanna go one step further and see the gene sequence. Um, ah, there's the gene. So we'd have to go to the ATPE gene, 
And if we go to that gene, um, oh, it's just redrawing me here. That's frustrating. Uh, ATPE gene sequence bacillus. We'll come back to this and show you. But I just want you to see that if you look up the gene sequence, it's just this massive, massive, massive uh, sequence of DNA. Um, and of course, I am missing it. But even just for this tiny little piece of DNA there, or protein there, oh, I'll come back to this. Yeah, okay, we'll come back to showing you the DNA sequence. Anyway, you'll find that some genes have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of letters in the code it takes to make them. All right, it can be very, very complicated, yeah. Yeah, absolutely some. I don't know. I think that sounds big to me, but I will look it up. But the point being, that's a lot of DNA. A lot of DNA. And how many genes roughly do we have? The number keeps changing, but in the tens of thousands of individual genes, which can then be mixed and matched to make different proteins, which is its own very interesting topic. All of which is to say, there's a lot of DNA in you. Um, we probably mentioned this in grade 10 or grade 11, but if you took all the DNA in a single cell, um, just one cell, and you stretched it out, it would la be about how tall? About two meters, taller than you. That's just one cell, and of course you're made of trillions and trillions of cells. Obviously, that presents a geometry problem. How do you fit all that DNA into a small little nucleus of Let's stretch it out linearly at two meters. Um, that is even given the fact that it makes this helix, right? So how do you take that and make it fit in a small spot? What? Yeah, how do you do that? You can coil it. You can kind of pack it up. Like, think of what you do with, like, you know, extension cords in your garage or with your headphones or anything like that, though probably none of you have headphones with pliers anymore not the creative like I am. But, uh, but regardless, if you take that and you coil it up, you can make it take less space. None of you probably have at home a telephone that has like, you know, that has like a base here and then like the headset here and then what connects them? But this coiled wire like that. Why is it a coiled wire? Yeah, so it's compact, but if you then have to like go around the corner so you can have a conversation your whole family isn't listening to you, you can stretch that out and make it stretch right out. Does that make sense? So this is kind of what DNA does at a really, really, really large scale. So I like this diagram. I think this is a really good one where we can see what DNA looks like all on its own. It's this double coiled strand of DNA. So this is two anti-parallel strands of DNA. And the first thing that happens is that these are wrapped around these molecules called histones. In fact, they're wrapped around eight histones. I don't know why eight happens to be the number, but they are. Um, so this, a nucleosome, is DNA wrapped around eight histone molecules. You don't have to worry about what a histone molecule looks like. Um, now, on one level, you might say, well, wait a minute, if we're trying to make this thing smaller, why would we introduce more stuff? Seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Trying to make this fit into a smaller space. But think about it like, does anyone have a garden hose and they have like the thing you wrap it around? Or in my garage, I have a bunch of extension cords because I have like a little workshop set up. And actually, I have extension cords set up in the same way that uh, Ms. Beccario has them in uh, the sewing room, right? Does she have, she has the ones that pull down? Are hers like, uh, are hers spring-loaded? So like if you pull it, it goes back up? Yeah, right, so that is making something take up less space by actually adding more stuff. I have the uh, air hose for my air compressor like that too. I got a big 200-foot hose so I can reach anywhere on my property with it but I can just spring it up and it goes up into a thing sitting in the rafters in my garage and it kind of stays out of the way. Does that make sense? 
That's the same principle here, which is if we take the DNA and we wrap it around these histones, we can get it to take up less linear space, even though we're adding a bit of volume. And the problem with DNA isn't that it takes up a lot of volume, it's that it's a really long molecule, so it takes up a lot of linear space. Does that make sense? So by wrapping, we can reduce its length, even though, like we can reduce its apparent length, even though we're taking up a bit more volume. Um, the histones are interesting too, though, because they can be used in addition to wrapping the DNA up, we can use them as an indication of how much we want to use a particular piece of DNA. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, but uh, now we do this a bunch of times. So we take the DNA, and at kind of regular intervals, we wrap it around histones, all right, making what we call these nucleosomes. And once we've made a bunch of nucleosomes, we can actually take that whole structure and we can coil it. So now we're really packing this stuff up, right? This is a coil of histones and each hit of nucleosomes, really, and each nucleosome is DNA coiled around these histones. Can you kind of picture that? So the result of that is this fiber of DNA that is still quite narrow. It's about 30 nanometers in diameter. So the 30 nanometer fiber is a coil of nucleosomes, which is a coil of a coil, or what we call a? A super coil. That's the actual word for it. Isn't that great? So this is what we call super coiled DNA. But of course, we know uh, that if you want to increase the surface area of a given linear thing, what can you do with it? This actually looks familiar to things we see elsewhere, right? This looks familiar because it kind of looks like the Christe of the mitochondrion, but also kind of looks like the Rugae uh, of the stomach, and it also kind of looks like the villi of the uh, small intestine. But if you fold, if you have this kind of fold, um, you can have it take up less length again. So this is folded supercoils. Which gives us uh, fiber that's about 300 nanometers across. Which is still quite small. And then what could you do with that? Well, you could take that and you could coil it. What is this hypercoil? Yeah. So now we take those folds and we coil. So this is coiled, folded, coiled coils. No, it's not. But I'm just, I'm just trying to give you a sense of what's actually happening here. What? I'm not messing with you. This is what it actually is. As to, are you going to find this in a textbook? No. No, that's not the name. But... Um, Well, I'm glad you asked. If you do that, and you make a 3D shape of it, and then you fold and coil that on itself, eventually we get this structure. And what is this structure called? This is the chromosome. And this is the folded coil of folded coiled coils. Yeah. So the folded coil. Of folded, <laughs> coiled coils. Okay, what's the real name? Chromosome. A chromosome. No, not that. The 700 nanometer one. They call it the 700 nanometer fiber. And they call this the 300 nanometer fiber. And they call this the 30 nanometer fiber. And they call these nucleosomes. And they call this double, co uh, uh, double helical DNA. It's a folded super coil. They stick to the diameter, and the diameter is a good indication, right? Because we start with uh, we start with a single strand of DNA, which is merely two nanometers across, very, very, very small. A nanometer is times ten to the negative nine meters, so we're talking about a very small uh, diameter to be sure. And when you put that around a histone, you get something that's eleven nanometers in diameter. 
And that, they don't refer to these by number. Everything beyond this, when you look up in a textbook, they just use the number. So when you take those histones, uh, those nucleosomes, which is it round, wrapped around the, the histone and coilate, they call that the 30 nanometer fiber, and that's the term you'll see. Then when they fold those, they call that the 300 nanometer fiber. And then when they coil that folded, coiled DNA, they call that uh, the 300 nanometer fiber, or sorry, the 700 nanometer fiber. And then when you tightly pack and fold that into this characteristic shape, we call that the chromosome. All right. Now, you should know that DNA is not always fully folded. In fact, it's not usually fully folded. Why not? Yeah, very good. Remember, the chromosomes are actually, or the DNA is actually working data. So the cell needs access to the DNA. Man, access is one of those words that no matter how many times I spell it, it will never look right to me. We're going to do whole lessons on how the cell uses DNA. That's not today, but we're going to. Um, enough to know today that if the DNA were super coiled, 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 folded, coiled, whatever, whatever, in the chromosomes at all times, uh, how would you get at any of that inner DNA to read it and use it and transcribe it? And of course, you couldn't, right? It wouldn't be available. At the same time, can the DNA be completely uncoiled all the time? No, because then it would be two meters long in a cell that is, you know, uh, 10 to the negative six meters wide, right? So that doesn't work. Uh, you can't be, uh, you know, 10,000 times bigger, or sorry, 200,000 times bigger than the thing you're contained in. That'd be 2 million, wouldn't it? Can't be 2 million times bigger than your container. That doesn't work. So it also can't be fully uncoiled. I know. I'm being particularly messy today. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, moving forward, make an effort to be much neater. Now, at what point does the cell fully fold this stuff so that it forms a chromosome? It's not the purpose of today's lesson, but you know this. You know when the DNA folds into tight chromosomes. Same reason you at home might take the situation where some stuff is stored away and some stuff isn't, and you might put it all into boxes and pack all of it away. When would you do that? When you're moving, right? When you're, when you're saying like, hey, okay, we're gonna have to get everything out of here and go to a new place. Um, what's the cell equivalent of that? Cells don't have blood. I mean, blood has cells, but. When does a cell have to pack up everything and say, okay, we better keep this safe and secure so we can get moving? Mitosis, because what happens during mitosis? Yeah, they're gonna have to move and line up at the poles, right? That's, but what happens in prophase? We coil, we form the chromosomes, because what's gonna happen immediately after that, which is potential danger for the DNA? Nucleus is going to dissolve, right? And then in metaphase, they'll line up at the, uh, the equator. Um, crossing over will happen. In anaphase, random assortment will happen where the, each chromosome gets split, right? And pulled to one end or the other. And then, uh, sorry, if we're in meiosis, crossing over and random assortment would happen. In mitosis, they'll just get pulled, split in half. Um, and then a new nucleus forms, right? At that stage, we fully pack into the chromosomes, which is why we do see this sometimes. The rest of the time, some of the DNA will be tightly, tightly packed, and some of the DNA will be loosely packed. At home, you probably have some things that are like in Rubbermaid boxes. Does anyone have stuff they keep like in the attic, and like every once in a while you have to go up into the attic? And does anyone have like an unfinished attic? Like my attic is, I like have to take some shelves out of the cupboard to get into it, and I have to like open a panel at the back, and I go in, and it's like all insulation, and I try to go up and get stuff in there, and I'm itchy for the next few days, and it's all insulation. Does anyone else live like this? I live like this, and yet I keep stuff up there. Why do I keep stuff up there? Out of the way. Keep it out of the way. 
So you get one for you to roll. So all of our crits and stuff roll, right? So twice you arrive to roughly the death rattle, right? Once to take it all out, and once to put it all back. So a Halloween stuff for each of you, right? The Halloween stuff coming in, the Christmas stuff going out, at least that's the same day. So like three days a year I have to go off work, right? Yeah. And then every once in a while, uh, I have a bizarre system where there's a switch up there that controls all of my outdoor lighting because I ran out of wire on the day I was doing it, so I just wired the smart switch into my attic because it's controlled by a phone anyway. But if we ever have a bad power outage and it comes back on, all the outdoor li lights on my house just flash incessantly and I have to go up and reset the switch for them, so then I have to crawl up into the attic. And One of these days I should probably fix that. But Anyway, it was a hot day working up in the attic and like I said, I ran out of wire, so I was like, you know where the switch for this is going? Right here, right in this spot here in my attic. Um, but what, what kind of stuff do we put in our attic? Would it be smart for me to put my dinner plates that I use every day for dinner in there? It'd be very stupid, right? What about like my socks? Good place for me to put my socks? Yeah. Probably not, right? What kind of stuff do we put in the attic? Yeah, stuff we don't use very often, right? Like somewhere in my attic, there's a box of all of my university papers. Which will be of interest to whom exactly? You. <laughs> no. Oh my god, no. No, nobody! No! No, I was too sentimental to throw them out, so when I die, my kids will have to throw them out. And maybe, just maybe, they'll like feel a little guilty about it and be like, do I put this in my attic? And who knows, maybe my university crap will end up in my kid's attic, and then my grandkids will have to throw it out. Or something, I don't know, the people who buy that house eventually. The point being, nobody is ever going to look at that crap. You have the equivalent of that in your DNA. In fact, your DNA contains some really interesting nonsense that you keep in the attic. Your DNA contains billions of years worth of viruses attacking us and injecting their DNA into us. We have whole sections of our DNA which are just viral DNA from infections we survived. And it just hangs out there. We don't use it, but it's there. Interesting, right? It's hanging out. Uh, we have other sections of our genome which currently we classify as, and this is actually the scientific term, junk DNA. Is it? Maybe. Possibly. I'll say that 20 years ago a lot of what we classified as junk DNA we now understand to actually have function. Will eventually we understand more of it to have function? I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, uh, as I can attest, in 40 years of life you, are, you acquire a bunch of crap that you're never going to use. Well now imagine in three billion years of evolution. You require a lot of genetic crap that you're never going to use, right? On the other hand, you probably have things in your house that you keep in cupboards readily available, right? And then you probably have some things that you keep just out all the time, because you use them all the time, right? Probably your phone charger, you don't have a box that you put it in and put it in a drawer unless you're like a hyper neat person. Probably it's just plugged in ready all the time, right? Um, probably in your kitchen you have some things that live in cupboards and drawers, and you probably have some things that just sit out on the counter, right? I'd imagine. Probably have a knife block with knives that you use and maybe a cutting board to sit out. I don't know, it depends on how much you cook. But does that make sense? Your DNA is going to work the same way. So if we look at DNA, scientists can actually learn a lot about what DNA gets used. This is called DNA expression by how it's packed up. Um, so we said that this hypertype coiling, the chromosomes, we really only seen, we only see during replication. Either mitosis or meiosis um, during cell division. Um, but what's interesting is beyond that, uh, an active chromosome has this much looser element to it. Active chromosomes are the 30 nanometer fiber um, kind of coiled up like this. But even then, that tells us something. Um, during interphase, so during normal cell life, seldom used genes are packed in the 30 nanometer fiber and regularly used genes
are exposed between nucleosomes. In other words, if you have a gene that's going to get used a lot, um, we have it exposed on the surface here. And this is sometimes called the beads on a string DNA. This is that DNA that is just a single, well, a double strand, but that a single bead, a line of double-stranded DNA wrapped around the histones. If you have a gene that's actively in use, it's going to be visible and exposed there. The study of what genes get used is called epigenetics. Epi Genetics. There we go. Um, and it's a fascinating field. It's also a field that barely existed when I was a university student. It was just kind of on the cusp. Um, the 90s and the early 2000s was kind of the golden age of DNA research. It was when everything was genetic. It was the instant problem, the solution to every problem in the world was genetic in nature. Um, but in my lifetime, we went from, you know, the era of DNA fingerprinting where we could kind of loosely cut DNA up into strands and kind of use that to make a pattern, which was something that at the time was being done in fancy labs, and we are going to do in a lab here. Now, to be clear, when we do DNA fingerprinting in a lab here with the uh, gel electrophoresis machine, you should expect our data to be horrible, abysmal. Probably we will get complete garbage data, just utter trash, but we're going to do it. Um, and the reason we're probably going to get utter trash data is because if you were setting up a lab where you were doing that, you'd do it thousands of times, and the first, first bunch of thousands of times you did it would all be just refining. You'd be figuring your process out and really locking it down. Does that make sense? And we're going to do it once. And as we saw in our chromatography lab, when you do something just once, what kind of data do you get? Often pretty junky data, right? Um, this, by the way, is why college students who study chemistry and biology are in demand for jobs, and university students who study biology and chemistry aren't in terms of getting lab jobs. Because university students who study biology and chemistry get some time in the lab, but they also spend a lot of time in theoretical stuff, right? Textbook studying, theory, theory, theory. And people who go to college for lab for biology and chemistry tend to be doing technical biology and chemistry, which is to say they're doing hands-on work. So they spend most of their time in the lab, and they get repeats, they get repetition, they learn those skills cold. So when the time comes that you know a place is looking to hire, most places that are hiring people, they're not hiring many jobs in the theoretical field. There might be some, like they're hiring people to demonstrate how could you do this, what you know, what's the theory. But mostly what they're hiring is people to actually do the work. And when you're hiring someone to do the work, what kind of student do you want? You want someone who has lots of practice. So keep that in mind. If you really like working in lab, I love working in lab. Um, you know, if I were doing it over again, I would think long and hard about going to college for a technical science diploma because that can give you an opportunity then to actually work in a lab. And depending on which field you take, it doesn't have to be that you learn just one skill. If you go into medical, the medical field, it tends to be that you get very specialized. You do radiology or you do an ultrasound technician or you do kind of very specific things. And then you're kind of locked into that one skill. There's nothing saying you can't only certify for another skill. But if you were to say study, uh, you know, being a chem lab tech, you'd learn a variety of skills and you could end up working in food science, doing like uh, nutrient analysis or working in, you know, the pharmaceutical industry or working in, uh, you know, beverages and spirits. There's lots of different opportunities and really cool opportunities. So if you like lab work, uh, A, know that in high school, when we do something once and get kind of crummy data, that's to be expected. Um, oh, Daryl, oh, I think you saw it. The tag fell off that one yesterday. It, it appears to be back on. I probably could have done that myself. Um, yeah, so DNA has gone from being this kind of very basic skill, and in my lifetime, we went from doing that to having the whole human genome mapped, knowing what every single letter and code is, um, at a cost of billions of dollars, to now 
yeah, you can go to 23andMe and for like a few hundred bucks get like a GNA basic roadmap done where they just do the more basic thing, the kind of thing we do in the lab here where they look at key markers. But still now for about, I want to say six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000, if you had to, you could get your entire DNA mapped. That's crazy. Like I said, a mere 20 years ago, doing that once cost billions with a B of dollars. And we are very close to the $1,000 genome where you can go in a lab and just for about 1000 bucks get your genome parsed, which is crazy. Yeah. Of what genes are used and when? Sorry, and. The study of what genes are used and when, and if you really wanted to make that less awful as a sentence, and when they are used, yeah, that's a better sentence, is called epigenetics. Um, I would love to take a course on epigenetics. I would love to know more about it. Um, I've just done kind of my own personal reading, and it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. This is an interesting thing, too, where they've discovered that Say you take two identical twins raised in two different families, obviously identical twins, what's true about their DNA? Same, right? That's the definition of being an identical twin, right? If you're an identical twin, um, one egg is fertilized by one sperm, you get a single embryo, though when the first cell division happens, instead of those staying together and forming a new organism, when the first cell division happens, they split. And because they split, all of a sudden those can keep splitting and keep splitting and you get two organisms that are identical. Well, what's crazy is they've shown that just because you have the same DNA as somebody um, doesn't mean that you use your genes the same way. And you can actually study somebody's epigenetics. You can make a map of it. You can do different assays called like a northern blot or a western blot. And you can actually see what genes are turned on in this person's cells more often and turned off. And we do that with different cell types. We see muscles use different cell, use different sections of the DNA than skin cells, than blood cells. But if you do that with the muscle cells from two different people, even though they're identical twins, you'll see that their lifestyle, the choices they've made, the places they've been, how they've been raised, all that, actually change how their DNA gets read, what genes get turned on and turned off. Um, people who exercise a lot, yeah, they get more fit, but interestingly, the genes involved in getting more fit get activated more often, which means that people who are fit, the genes start to reflect that. The interesting thing is that, it turns out, can be passed on too. So even though we know that you can't pass on big muscles by working out, it turns out you can, turn, you can pass on a propensity to use those genes. Interesting. So your lifestyle choices actually will affect the genes you pass on to your children. Something interesting to think about. Um, and something we didn't know 30 years ago, and we're really only working our way through now. Okay, now, noteworthy that when the time comes to divide the cell, the DNA is gonna look like this. Remind me, why do we make the DNA look like this? This is a chromosome. And what's the purpose of put packing DNA into a chromosome? Yeah, so it's gonna split in half. We know that this is two copies, right? So this is duplicated, and we pack it like that to keep it safe, right? We pack it like that to keep it safe and to keep it organized, because we're going to have to move this to two ends of the cell. And you can imagine if it was just a big, long chain, imagine trying to move, you know, house from one place to another, and all of your extension cords and all of your headphones and all of your uh, Christmas lights and everything that has along all your ropes and chains. Do you have a lot of ropes and chains at home? are uncoiled and they're just dragging out behind your car. How would that be as a moving experience? Pretty chaotic, right? Um, so the chromosome, uh, I'm asking if you do. I don't. I think I probably have one rope. I have a rope uh, and I have a winch. I think there's two types of people in the world. People who have winches in their trunk in case they need them, which I never have, and suckers. Yeah, like a winch, like I can hook it up to my car battery and it's got a, it's got a high tensile steel line on it with a hook on the end and it'll like wheel that thing in. So like if I ever need to like pull myself out of a ditch or like pull a tree down or something that, you know, can handle the very lightweight of my, you know, passenger car, um, I'm ready. I have a winch. I've never had cause to use this, but man, I saw that thing at Canadian Tire and I was like, I need it. I need it. I need this in my trunk right now. So there it lives. Something's on sale at Canadian Tire, I will buy it. It really doesn't matter what it is. I'm like, 80% off. How could I say no? 
And nowhere else. There's something about that aisle at the center of Canadian Tire where they just put totally random stuff. And there's like, you know, there's like knives next to like an air compressor next to like old cans of paint they haven't been able to sell. I'm like, I'm buying all of it. Just give me it all. And I'll say your new beautiful fancy Canadian Tire here in Welland has lost that chaotic middle aisle where they just pile stuff and they're losing business from me because you put stuff in that chaotic pile at the middle of the Canadian Tire with that yellow sticker on it telling me it's cheaper than it's supposed to be. And I'm like, I didn't know I needed a second table saw just in case, but now I realize I need this table saw. A MIG welder? Why wouldn't I have a MIG welder? I have a MIG welder. <laughs> yeah, well, I've messed around with it a bit. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's something about... I don't know what it is. It's in my epigenetics, because my dad's like that, too. My dad will show up and be like, I bought you a brad nailer. I'm like, I have two brad nailers. He's like, did you buy the one on tail at Canadian Tire? I'm like, I did. He's like, I bought you it, too. Now I have three brad nailers. Why? I don't know why, but I've got them. A brad na Brads are like just very low gauge, so they call something a brad nail if it's below 18 gauge. So it's just fine nails. You use it for like finishing work in carpentry. Air nailer is nice. Okay. Uh, how thick it is, yeah. Not the length, but the thickness of the nail determines its gauge. And I think, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, anything smaller than 18 Brad. gauge. I don't know. Talk to Brad. <laughs> fair, fair enough. All right. <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't considered that. Um, anyway, uh, that's true. Maybe somebody was just making fun of a friend. Anyway, here we are. All right. So now let's talk about DNA replication. You know that cells spend most of their life cycle in what do we call this stage? All of this. Interphase. All right? Interphase is a cell living its normal cell life. So interphase is the stage of the life cycle. where the cell undergoes normal cell function. But if that cell is going to reproduce, which in a single-celled organism is going to happen, in a multicellular organism, not all of your cells do, but that if that cell is going to reproduce, it will replicate its DNA during interphase. In other words, it doesn't wait until it has begun the process of reproduction to make a copy of its DNA. It does that during its normal life cycle. Sorry? Yeah, sure. Would you prefer if I said its? Be a bit more grammatical here. And these are kind of short form notes, but Nice to be grammatical. All right, so this happens in the nucleus. During what we call the S phase, which, I mean, the S phase is just called because it's the stage of replication but during the S phase of interphase. Okay. Now, you might remember from grade 11 how this happened. You drew a diagram of it. And I probably made you di draw a diagram of it a bunch of times. And sometimes we drew it actually putting like A, G, C, T. And sometimes we just do it as strands. But we kind of drew what this looks like. So you may remember the mechanism. But in case you don't remember the mechanism, let's talk about how this could happen. So you've got DNA. Now, DNA is a really, really, really long strand of double helical DNA. And like we said above, it's coiled around histones, and then those form a 30 nanometer coil by coiling around themselves, and that folds, and that coils, and that folds, and blah, blah, blah. How do you take that and make a copy of it? And 
Again, you might know this because I drew it in a diagram yesterday, right? Um, or last year. But if you hadn't drawn that, the question would be rise, how might this look? Um, so the question is, what is the mechanism? of DNA replication. So let's look at this. Um, if we had to break it down to kind of three ideas of how this might happen, um, there's kind of three ways in which it might. And the first idea is that DNA could be, replication could be conservative. What does it mean to conserve something? Keep it, not use it. Uh, to not use it, to not to keep it, to keep it, right? To, uh, to not destroy it, to not change it, right? Conservative uh, is a term we use to people who sort of don't believe in uh, change for change's sake, let's say, charitably. Um, if we talk about conservation um, of, say, like the forest, we talk about like not going in and like cutting down trees, right? So the idea that DNA replication could be conservative would say this, that if we have a double-stranded DNA, and I'm going to draw the two strands in two different colors. Oh, well, that was silly of me. Well, that was even sillier. Okay. So there's a double-stranded DNA. The idea is maybe there is some mechanism in conservative replication. We would maybe read this without changing it, the original. So Maybe we have some kind of protein, some kind of enzyme that floats along here and makes a copy of it. Yep. What am I looking at? Yeah, not my best choice. Not, I don't, I don't know why that was set up that way. Maybe I will do this. That's better. I like that better. Okay. What is that setting? Oh. My fourth period class likes to draw things on my tablet, which I support. But So maybe we could take this and kind of straighten it out, make it a little easier to read, and we could put like some kind of enzyme on here, and as we go along, it could make a copy of it, right? And of course, because DNA is double-stranded, you know, it could look like that. Something like this. And obviously, I'm not suggesting that this is the exact mechanism, but something where as we go along, we are making a copy of the original without damaging it, right? And this previous, you know, could go on and form the coil it needs to coil, and there we go. And if we go back, this would, you know, recoil itself as well. Does that make sense? And if this is how it's done, we would say that it's conservative. So we would then say that the new strand is all new nucleotides. Old strand is all old nucleotides. And it's not hard to imagine that this could be the mechanism, right? Um, in fact, probably, this is what we'd imagine. If I were going to uh, photocopy something for you, which I almost never do because I can just print, right? But if I was going to photocopy something for you, when you got your copy, would you have any of my originals? Would one of your pages be my original? Probably not, right? Does that make sense? If I was going to photocopy the textbook for you, I would go take the textbook and put it in the photocopier. And when you got your stapled together package, would any of the pages in yours be a torn out page from the textbook? No. 
Um, a few years back when I was at South Lincoln, uh, and they wouldn't give us a PDF copy of uh, the textbook we were using, um, I took one of each of my science textbooks down to the shop, and I used the bandsaw to cut the binding off, and then I went and fed them through the auto feeder on the photocopier and made a big giant PDF of them. Um, right? Yeah. I was annoyed. They wanted to charge me like hundreds of dollars for a PDF copy, so I thought, nuts to you, McGraw-Hill. Why am I admitting to this, son? And then I did nothing with that PDF and never gave it to anyone because that would be copyright infringement, which I would never do. Eh? Shaking your head, yes. Eh? Exactly, I'm shaking my head, yes. That's what I did. Um, so, thank you, Preston, for confirming my basic decency and honesty. Um, but that would be this model, conservative. Um, yes, I took a bandsaw to those original textbooks, but all the same, if I were to make a copy of that, which I would never do, uh, when I made a copy of it, nobody would be getting the original pages of the textbook, right? You just make a copy of it. Um, so that's one possibility that scientists had to be on the lookout. The other idea is semi-conservative. And what would that look like? Well, the idea there is what if we took this double-stranded DNA And what if we took it and just split the two strands up? Then what could we do with each strand? Because what do we know about DNA? We know that DNA serves as a template for the other side, right? Because DNA has to be complementary. Um, we know that if you read this blue side, it will tell us how to make that green side. Does that make sense? You don't actually have to read both strands. So it's possible that this is how DNA gets reproduced, that we use, that we end up making uh, two strands out of the original and so each strand would be, each new strand or each new copy of DNA is 50% old and 50% new. Again, these are just possibilities. This is what scientists had to be on the lookout for. These both assume, by the way, that we take the piece of DNA and we keep it whole. What's the third possibility? Yeah, maybe we cut this thing up. Maybe we say working with a big, massive, single strand of DNA is a chaotic idea, and maybe it's dispersive, which would be the idea that maybe we take that original strand of DNA and we, like, chop it to bits, and we get, like, little bits of green floating around, little bits of blue floating around, and then all of those get doubled up and reassembled. Now, God willing, that's not the mechanism, because that's chaotic, but would that be the most chaotic thing the cell had ever seen? Well, there's lots of chaos in the cell. So scientists didn't know. We did not know which of these mechanisms end up being the mechanism. So how would you test this? We don't have a microscope to this day that will get us in on fine enough detail in a living system to watch this process happen. We just can't do it. It's too small. Does that make sense? So how do you test to see which of these is happening? This is one of my favorite experiments. I'd like to tell you about what I think is just a really brilliant experiment. Um, and it's pretty old. This was done a long time ago. Um, yeah, this is one of, my, one of my favorites. And it incorporates something else. If the 90s and early 2000s was the era of genes in science, where everything was genetics, and if you wanted to get grant money, you had to be into genes. What was everything about in the 40s and 50s? Genes, the era of genes. In fact, they called it the blank age. 
Before the space age, we call the systems the space age. What came before that? The deep space age. No. It's inaugurated in 1945, rather unfortunately. Rather tragically. The atomic age. Oh. The atomic age. Um, and in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, before the space race, everything was atomic research. My grandfather had a PhD in mathematics from King's University, and his first job, um, or what would have been his first job, except he went, and then when they told him what they wanted him to do, he quit, uh, was he got hired by the US Department of Defense. And they took him down uh, to Nevada, and what they wanted him to do was be part of a team that went out and took measurements of nuclear tests and uh, built models based on them. And he said, I don't think this is for me. He left and he became a high school math teacher. Um, what? Yeah, it's a true story. My grandpa. Um, my grandpa was famously the world's most intense high school math teacher. And to this day, it's starting to stop happening because my grandpa retired about, let's see, he died 22 years ago. He retired about 10 years ago. Yeah, so he retired about 30 years ago. Um, but I, when I taught in South Lincoln, my grandfather had taught in Beansville. And I would regularly get parents to come to parent teacher interview and say, is your dad a math teacher? And I said, no, my grandpa was. And then inevitably I'd get, that son of a bitch failed me twice. And I'd go, yeah, that sounds like my grandfather. Um, fam famously incredibly hardcore. Uh, he wouldn't give me dessert until I'd like answered a calculus question at like age 13. Um, so if you're wondering how I turned out, how I turned out. And then get the calculus so, question, right? Oh yeah. I, it was funny because he for years had written the Queen's math test. Um, which we haven't run here in a few years. I want to get going with again. Or the Waterloo math test, sorry. And he'd been on the writing team for them. So he decided he was going to make me like live vicariously through me in this. So he would like train me. He'd come in and we'd do like practice sessions. And so I was a pretty good math student, but nothing special. But he would be like, there'll be two of these questions, one of those, you can guarantee this, you'll see that, you'll see this. And so like the three years I did uh, the Queen, the Waterloo math contest in high school, I got like top mark in my school, like near top mark from GSTN. And it seemed very yeah. impressive, but it really wasn't because, again, I just had somebody sitting there being like, do you want pie? Answer this question. I'd be like, I do want pie. Give me the pie. That's and so, or pie. No, no, it was like pecan or like <laughs> cherry. I like pecan pie. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, Preston. Not the last time I'm going to say that. Um, so in the atomic era, how do you approach every problem? Radiation, baby! That's the answer. This is a great experiment. It's, it's so clever, it's so interesting, which is um, how to design an experiment to see which model is true. So we cannot we cannot, cannot, cannot um, see DNA. It's too small. But here's what you can do. Um, and you could do this at home if you want. You could go online and see how to extract DNA from a strawberry. Which, did we do that in our uh, grade 11 bio? Did I do bananas or whatever? Did I do a DNA extraction? No, I didn't like you guys. But last crew, did I? Yeah. Bananas, right? And so with some pretty basic household materials, a bit of soap, right, and some acid, you can actually get the DNA to come out of a cell, and then you can, did we spool it up, and you can kind of get, it just comes out like a big string, and it just kind of looks like goop, right? Okay, so you can do that. So, we're in the isotopic era, the radioactive era, the era of looking at nuclear science, and if you're in chemistry, you know about isotopes. What are isotopes? Nope, that's ions. And ion specifically. Oh. Same atom, different number of different number of <laughs> neutrons. Well, neutrons have mass, right? So same atom but different masses. Ah. So turns out uh, most atoms have a couple stable isotopes. And in the atomic era, this becomes very important. Turns out if you want to get uh, fusion to happen, it really helps to be working with hydrogen that has some extra neutrons. 
uh, because it's way heavier, and so you can blast these things into each other. Um, so if you are trying to uh, do nuclear fusion, it's all about isolating nice heavy isotopes, and this becomes a big focus in the 40s and 50s. You can read about the Manhattan Project. But um, the great thing is guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine are nitrogenous bases. They're made of nitrogen. So what if when we let some bacteria replicate, what if we isolated specific isotopes of nitrogen? And again, isotopes have different masses. So this is nitrogen with different masses. You may have heard of heavy water. I haven't heard that expression before. If you make water, normally water, oxygen weighs 16 grams per mole, hydrogen weighs one gram per mole, um, and there's two of them. So normally a mole of water weighs 18 grams. But you can get deuterium, which is hydrogen that instead of weighing one gram per mole is hydrogen with a neutron and now it weighs two grams per mole. And this weighs 16, and this weighs two grams per mole. And so you can get water that actually weighs 20 grams per mole. You can get water that is perfectly pure water, but is a little bit more than 10% more heavy, 10% denser. Well, you can do the same thing with nitrogenous bases. What you can do is in a lab, you can go isolate some heavy nitrogen. And then you can make sure that your bacteria are growing in an environment where they only have access to heavy nitrogen. And then you can let that happen for a bunch of generations. The nice thing with bacteria is they repro reproduce really quickly. So you let bacteria reproduce for a bunch of days in heavy nitrogen. All of their DNA is going to be made with this nitrogen that's heavy. Does that make sense? And then what you can do is you can take those bacteria and you can do exactly what we did with that banana. You can do a DNA extraction. And then instead of just putting a little uh, you know, thing in there and drawing it out, you can put it in a centrifuge. I've shown you my centrifuge in the back. You spin things down. And when you spin things down in a centrifuge, it separates them based on their weight. Heavy things go to the bottom. Light things come to the top. And so what you can do is you can take that bacterial culture, isolate its DNA, spin it down, and you'll have a bunch of lines of stuff. The phospholipid bilayer will collect in one spot because it has a set weight. Um, proteins will form in a spot, all this. But DNA, which there's a lot of, is going to make a line. So here we have the DNA, and it's the DNA with the heavy nitrogen. Um, and then here's what you can do you can move it into a new medium, and this new medium, instead of heavy nitrogen, can have light nitrogen. Does that make sense? And what you can do then is you can let them start to replicate, but not finish. Does that make sense? Start to replicate, but not finish. In other words, at this stage, you would say they're still in interphase. But after replication. And and when we let that happen, what do we see? Well, we see that we let it grow in this light nitrogen medium, but when we spin it down, where do we find the band of DNA? It's no longer as heavy as it was, but it's also not light enough, if you do the math, to be made fully of light nitrogen, which means that after one round of replication, what do we have? Well, we have all of the DNA 
is the same weight. And specifically, is it as heavy as it used to be? Is it light? That would tell us that all the DNA is brand new with the lighter medium. So it's kind of middleweight. But then, if you let this stuff keep replicating, you let the DNA keep growing, eventually you get, yeah, after a few rounds, you get some that are all new nitrogen, and you still get this band remains that is 50-50. New and old. But that band doesn't get wider, it doesn't get bigger. So if you keep them replicating, this band gets bigger and bigger, right? And this band stays the same size. This is a classic experiment. This was done by Matthew Men Messelson and Franklin Stahl. Messelson and Stahls. Um, the same, same size. Oh, uh, the, the band, A band, if that helps, remains, that is 50-50. So we get this band here, a band remains, that's 50-50. You'll, you'll be okay. Yeah. I mean, you don't even have to write anything I said because it is all explained here, but I always find it helpful to write things out. I'm a big believer that we learn hand to brain, that writing helps us process things, um, which is why I believe it's important to draw things, why I believe it's important to write things. Even though my drawing sucks, the act of drawing makes me understand things, even though my messing is righty and my, my messy is writing. My writing is messy and my wording unclear. Uh, the act of messily writing and unclearly wording helps me process things. Um, do we see this experiment? It's a great one, it's really elegant. Because what it shows us is that the original DNA isn't preserved. Does that make sense? The original DNA was two strands that were both heavy nitrogen. And even after one round of replication, does that band exist anymore? No, which means DNA can't be conservative because after one round, this strand is gone. The original strand is no more. So this experiment right here tells us that DNA, that replication can't be conservative. The original all N15 strand is gone. And I am always amazed by research to think it's hard enough to interpret this experiment, right? Could you imagine thinking this up? Like how much brilliance does it take to say, we want to start to figure out how DNA replicates. We can't look at it, we can't watch it. We have no way to get a microscope down there and see it. How can we start to get a sense of how this happens? And somebody says, Ah, uh, well, we could grow bacteria in a growth medium that's all heavy nitrogen, um, allow it to replicate for a bunch of generations so that all of its DNA is going to be made from this, and then switch it over to a new medium, and then extract the DNA, spin it down, and see what happens to the weight. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, perfectly logical. Imagine thinking this up. It's so clever. Yeah, but here's what I love, too. The thing you can know is probably uh, Messelson and Stahl didn't wake up one day and go, we're going to do this. Probably they tried a hundred things that didn't tell them anything. Does that make sense? Science is so much the art of falling flat on your face and accomplishing nothing and then waking up the next day and going, all right, let's try this again, pavement, and falling on your face and accomplishing nothing and then waking up the next day and trying again. Um, and that is 
something you have to know about pure science. That's not what being a lab tech is. When I talk about what you do in college, that's like using skills that people have already identified and like working with them, right? Being a, being a chemistry tech or a biotech is like being a mechanic, right? It's taking things that have already been made and working with them, and it's so important. It's so important, we need good people to do that. That's what we need most people doing. But listen, this is what we call, and I've never liked this term, but you might hear it, the hard sciences, that doesn't refer to difficulty, though scientists would like you to think it refers to difficulty, but it just means it's like talking hard science fiction. It's kind of this concrete thing. But the hard sciences are all about learning new stuff. And learning new stuff is 99% failure. And when you all become voters, and you all have political influence, this is something you need to know. This is actually, if I can get on a soapbox and talk, we only have practical science because people did these hard sciences first, because people did the basic science research. And I prefer the term basic science. I think it's a much better descriptor. Basic science isn't sexy. It is mostly failure. It is mostly people in labs doing things over and over again and accomplishing very little. This is why they are always underfunded, because some technical group goes to the government and says, hey, we're doing some applied science and we think we can uh, you know, save 20% uh, fuel efficiency in cars uh, with this technology. And the government goes, yeah. And this other guy goes up and goes, I'm going to rattle around in my lab for 10 years and maybe accomplish nothing. And the government goes, eh, I'm not seeing it. Basic science research is always underfunded, but the reality of the matter is we only get new science if people are doing basic science. We only get practical things if people do this hard work first, and China knows it. They fund basic science like crazy. Uh, Russia knows it. They're funding basic science like crazy. India knows it. They fund basic science like crazy. And in North America, we have a real move towards not funding it, saying, ah, oh, we want practical things, and we're going to fall behind. And you should be scared of that because, listen, there hasn't been a new antibiotic developed in this world since the 1960s. This despite the fact that with every passing year, the antibiotics we have get less and less effective. These pharmaceutical companies selling products that work make money, but how this research change the world? So something to keep in mind. A, if you think you might want to be a scientist, which I hope some of you will, so I can live vicariously through you, and B, when you become voters, basic science research is important. Sorry? What, before voting? Yeah, no, I should mention it. You should vote. 